it's the usual. I found a new flight that I actually want to add into a week long or three week long trip. And so now I'm trying to shuffle everything and see if I can be stupid. Oh, so normal Seth day. Yeah. You're listening to Dots, Lines, and Destinations, a travel podcast with host Stephen Seagraves, Fosma Moon, and Seth Miller. Hello, and welcome to episode 481 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. I'm Stephen Seagraves, joined this week by Mr. Seth Miller. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right. Got allergies out the wazoo, but I'm doing okay. Excellent. Yeah. Um, we got some follow-up from last week. Uh, Allegris, Lufthansa. Yes. Uh, they had an event in Germany. My imitation must have gotten lost in us the strike. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we, were, we had talked about how which planes would have the first class seats or not uh, on that, that the first class seats that have, aren't available yet. The 359s will, in fact, have F, an F cabin uh, with the new layout. So that's interesting to note. Uh, they actually put a handful of economy seats and like marked them as in op can't be used. Get yeah. the front of the plane and put a little sign up that's like, first class is loading with like a spinning wheel kind of graphic kind of thing. So just good to know. Um, but the plane will enter service without first class cabin but with the space set aside. Interesting. Yeah. How many, do we know how many seats? Probably four. I would assume it's one row. Yeah. And the one seat is sort of a double. So remember. Interesting. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, the 359 having F is definitely a switch in kind of what I was thinking would happen. Um, I thought that was going to be like their business heavy plane, but I guess it still is. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, SAS definitely joining Sky Team. Yes, we talked about they had announced that they were leaving Star Alliance and everyone assumed rightfully that they're going to join Sky Team, but they hadn't formally announced it yet. They've formally announced it this week. So that's happening September 1st. Wow. It's big news. Yeah. yeah, glad to have it confirmed. Uh, obviously, you have to see how it integrates and earning rates and all that stuff and how quickly everything can be arranged. Oftentimes, those negotiations are challenging, but I imagine they've got a template to work with and everybody sort of knows what's going on. And it's because it's partially on by Air France KLM, it'll just roll in with some of that fun. I mean, are you going to try and get them before they leave Star Alliance? Are you going to try and get some flights? In so much as they are flying a nonstop from where I'm going to be to where I want to go in on July 5th, yes. But you're not like going out of your way to get them? Get them. No, in fact, they're flying the nonstop. And I have, this was, I had a ticket booked for on BA with a connection. We talked about this a while ago where I screwed up the reward and thought I had a first class, but it was Phantom Inventory. Mm -hmm. I canceled the business class. And so... They have a nonstop. There's over 40,000 point award seats. Um, I booked uh, one way each in premium economy with the stop. I booked us. I had a cash ticket that I had booked before I decided to stay in Europe longer. So I had a European originating round trip premium economy ticket on SAS. Um, I booked my wife a similar one and changed mine to fly from Copenhagen to Boston and then return to Europe at an, you know, somewhere at a date to be determined in the future and a destination to be determined in the future because I don't change feeds uh, and booked her a matching one. So hers was 80,000 points around trip, which is basically 40,000 one way, which I'm calling a win. Yeah, that's nice. That's uh, great, actually. I, I will admit, though, that was ultimate rewards points booked through their revenue portal. It's a 1200, you know, it was only a $1,200 ticket. I mean, I've done that. No. Yeah. Ultimate rewards. It's like, you're like, why not? Oh, well, that's good. So you yeah. get to fly him one last uh, time before yeah. guiding. Uh, one last time on Star, and then the return, though, as I talked about when we were talking about this, I, I have a return half booked, and I'm going to fly him on the part of Sky Team, and it is what it is. Yeah. yeah. I, I care much less about that these days than yeah. you know, non-stops at a reasonable price and an decent, comfort, decently comfortable seat. Yeah, that yeah, makes sense. Uh, let's talk about the new DOT rules. So this is new topics. Um, they have some rules on refunds for changed and canceled flights. Uh, what, are the, what are the details here? Yeah, so this is finalizing some proposed information from 18-ish months ago, 20-ish months ago. Uh, the airlines, not surprisingly, protested aggressively on it, but consumers mostly win, in my opinion here. So the rules are uh, if your flight is canceled for any reason, the airline is obligated to give you a refund, which you'd think is normal, decent, you know, practice, but was not, in fact, required previously. Uh you have to have the option of a refund if you want it. And similarly, if it is delayed or is the schedule is changed by more than three hours for domestic, three hours early departure or three hours late arrival uh, for domestic and plus or minus six for international, you can demand a cancel refund. 
Uh-huh. Okay. The caveat, and that includes like day of travel, sort of trip in vain stuff. If your flight is delayed significantly, you can say, nope, I'm, I'm noping out of this. Give me my money back. I'm going home. And some airlines have been better about that in the past than others. Obviously, uh, easier to do if you haven't left yet. Um, when you're halfway through the trip, it gets squirrely. But uh, the and I actually don't know that they necessarily cover that facts that facet of travel once you've started. But yeah. uh, especially low cost carriers had a habit of being like, no, we'll just give you a voucher. Sorry, and that will no longer be. Uh, they can give you a voucher, but they are obligated to tell you that you are entitled to a cash refund and to give it to you if you request it or original form of payment. Um, give me the cutoffs again. Timing: cut- three hours for domestic, six hours for international. So if if you're delayed six hours on an international flight, you're due a refund. If okay. you don't fly. Gotcha. Okay. And that's the thing that I got a lot of the initial analysis and excitement over this missed is you can take a refund and go home. You can take a refund and find a different ticket somehow if that's easier for you. Um, but you uh, it only counts if you don't fly. So this is not EU 261. I was delayed. Give me money. Uh, so there's that. Uh, the yeah. other facet of it that I find interesting is uh, there. there's an option that the airline can unilaterally say, there has been a change, we are refunding your money, goodbye, and not offer you reaccommodation. <laughs> uh, that one would like to assume that airlines won't be so stupid as to do that, but airlines are airlines and stupid things happen, so that is less great. Uh, everything else about it is shockingly good in favor of the passenger, I think. Like, to the point that changing the flight number but not changing the flight times counts as a cancel in the DOT's book. Hmm. So the rules are, right, I book, you know, Boston to Portland to come hang out with you, uh, and it's flight AS, whatever the number is. If Alaska Airlines changed that flight number and then I decided I didn't want to travel, I could demand that they give me my money back, even though it's the exact same flight times. And there's an argument that this will, you know, mess with airlines and how they do far future scheduling. And, you know, it'll be worse for consumers because the airlines will have to actually know what they're going to sell when they sell you the tickets uh, rather than putting placeholders in and things like that. The DOT's position is if you don't really change the flight time, odds are most passengers aren't going to ask for the refund. So stop worrying about this. Yeah. yeah. Right. So both that and the they can force cancel on you if the flight is delayed or canceled uh, and force refund you. Both of those are edge cases that no one expects to come into play, but both of them are interesting in that they exist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I could see that by the nerds being abused, but not by anybody else. Right. And we used to, I mean, back in the day, there was always the, oh, my flight changed 15 minutes. I want to rebook on a better connection and things like that. People used to play those games and you get the right agent. It works. Yep. So I understand the, the play there. Um, who knows if it's how much it'll get abused and we'll see. But um, the only, uh, yeah, th- so th- those are the main takeaways in my mind from it. But the the key one is it only counts if you don't actually take the trip, and that's something they got missed in a lot of the reporting. I feel like. Wow. Okay. Uh, airline systems still have a two year or two digit year problem. Yeah, this is awkward. Tell me about it. Um, there's a woman who's 101 or 104 and keeps booking herself a ticket and puts in her birth year as you know, 22 or 21 or whatever, and it's 1921. Yeah. And they keep insisting that she's an infant and needs uh, to pay for, like, either won't let her travel because she's too young as an unaccompanied minor or has to pay for the unaccompanied minor service. Wow. Oops. Wow. I'm impressed she's traveling. That's yeah. True. Yeah, right. I think she actually was a travel agent, like, booking, able to sort of book it herself. And it's American, I think, screwing it. But are, are all of them still using two digit systems? As far as I know. Yeah. Interesting. But, um, New IFE on JetBlue. Yeah, this is interesting. So it's the same IFE system, um, right? The Avant, Talis Avant hardware that is on all their Neos, most of their A320s, all the A220s, very much not on the 190s. Uh, and so this is the touchscreen video on demand, that the fancier version of all that stuff. Uh, they've added a couple interesting personalization features to it. And this is one of the, you know, I'm neck deep in this stuff very often. Uh, this is the first I can think of of an airline that's gone this far in trying to make it work. There's uh, one other airline, and so one of the things is uh, Party Party Watch or something like that, I forget what they call it, but uh, you can pick up to five other passengers on board and six of you can all pick the same movie. You all you know, invite other people to watch a movie with you and you hit play, 
and it starts on all six screens at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you can pause it together and things like that. So, uh, I guess it's cool that you all get to laugh at the same time. You're obviously all still listening through your own headphones, but, uh, I think that's cool. Uh, that's a nice feature. The personalization stuff is arguably more interesting to me. One of the features is that you get to set what name it says to you when you get on board. So like right now it says, hi, passenger first name based on yeah. what's in the ticket. Yep. Uh, there's now a field in your profile that you can have it call you something else. Can I have it call me doctor? Hi, doctor. Yeah. Hi, doctor. Uh, doctor. sure. You can also set your, you know, honorary title. That's so, uh, you know, hair doctor, cigarettes. Yeah. Good German, good German on them. Yes. Um, professor doctor, right? There's, there's some weird blends there anyway. Uh, so that's one cool thing, but beyond that, you can set preferences, like how you want closed captioning to appear or not what you want, you know, is adult, uh, is, uh, content controls on things like that. Uh, so there's some really interesting bits and you can also create playlists and save them and they will follow you flight to flight. And whatever you were watching last where if you know you didn't finish a uh, show tv or movie or whatever it will remember that up to six months and when you get back on board we'll say hi do you want to finish watching this movie that's yeah, kind of nice so like six months later i'd like to think you'd be like i finally call i got it already thanks but you know connecting flight later sure let's go return yeah. flight later absolutely right like i think there's some potential there i mean i'll be honest like i i sometimes take when i'm on like long holes or even short holes i might start a movie because I don't watch a ton of movies or TV and then I, I don't have time to finish and I, I might actually forget that I actually was watching it. So it is nice, you know. Oh, yeah, I, I, I think that this is actually, you know, one of those things that the industry has been talking about for at least the decade I've been working in it and uncovering it. And now they seem to sort of actually be finally implementing some of it. So I got a flight uh, in two and a half weeks that hopefully should be on a plane that has this hardware on it with the system. So I will get the experience. Uh, that's the other thing is it's basically live. They, they had it ready. They updated the software, they hit go, and then they were able to just do it. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Hopefully I'll have a report for real in a couple of weeks, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, American and Southwest both lost money in Q1. Yeah. And there's a lot more to this. Yeah. There's a lot on two different, uh, different levels for each of them. Uh, Southwest, uh, when asked about how they're going to actually boost revenue or, you know, various options there, still doesn't plan to charge for bags. They still see the value prop there of being able to advertise bags by free as huge, but has started teasing out ideas of segmentation, uh, segmentation for the seating product. And what that looks like remains to be seen, uh, obviously, with an open seating boarding, boarding number approach. It's harder to implement something like that, uh, certainly in a guaranteed way. But, you know, will they shift positions of seats around? Will they rearrange and have some with more leg room or other things who can say, will they go full on and just do assigned seats? Maybe there's obviously a lot of different ways this can play out. But I feel like this is there's always been a sort of like, yeah, we'll figure something out. We'll figure something out. We'll find a way to boost our ancillaries without charging for bags. This feels to me like the first time they've really come up with a plan. So do you have an idea of what they're actually going to do? Like how to make this work? No. Do you think they actually have a real plan or are they just saying they have a plan? I think they probably do. Um, one interesting thinks, well, I think, thing, I think, is that they do have uh, some planes coming with a new seat on board. Um, I'd have to check on if those already started showing up or not. Um, see if I can get that while we're talking here. But, you right. Know, yeah, that's that's when you change things, right? If, if you're getting some new planes in and you can do it on just some planes. So in 2025, the planes will start getting delivered with the Recaro seats on board. Um, with the adjustable headrests and some other things like that. The stuff they, and, you know, tablet holders, yada, yada, yada. So the stuff they showed uh, shows it nose to tail, but that could potentially be a thing that they could... Um, do on a subfleet. I'd, I'd be. It would be weird if they did like assign seating on a subfleet and not on the full fleet. How do you yeah. manage that? That's a sh- disaster waiting to happen. So, I mean, I uh, is it going to be that big of a deal for people? You think? I tend to know what it's going to be. Yeah. Um, but same number of seats on board. So if they, the only thing I think is if they added more extra leg room seats, that means some folks in, in the back are going to have less space if they shift things around. But yeah, yeah. really hard to tell what it's going to be right now. But we'll have to see how that goes. Yep. True. Um, and then American, uh, seems like they're really having some trouble. Well, 
there's obviously a lot of challenges that they've been facing and they've been sort of fighting with uh, corporate customers. And by fighting with, I mean, they kind of fired their entire in-house sales team and maybe not entire, but most of, and are trying to force all corporate agents to use their NDC direct booking rather than putting stuff into legacy GDS platforms and the travel agents aren't necessarily supporting it. And so there's some thought that because the, tra- the corporate agents can't really support American systems, they're just booking passengers on other airlines. <laughs> Um, and so that's a, that's cool, I guess. But, uh, one of the interesting things in their quarterly call last week, uh, they were asked about this and what corporate, what's going on with corporate, uh, because corporate is recovering managed corporate travel, America or not America, excuse me, United Delta, Alaska, all said is coming back nicely, uh, which are three airlines with most of their hubs on coasts. Yep. Interestingly, uh, and Vasu Raja, who's, I forget his title, but senior in routes and stuff like and commercial there uh it was quoted in the uh his quote in the response to that query sort of like what are you guys doing are you feeling the pain here is quote as corporates are coming back they're coming in more just they're coming in more disproportionately to coastal markets where we're relatively smaller as unmanaged comes business comes back it comes back in the heartland and the sunbelt where we are relatively larger so that impacts some of the numbers you see end quote and so it says clearly American has made a play to own the Sun Belt and right, they're growing out of Charlotte, they're growing out of Dallas, they're growing out of Phoenix, they're doing a lot of travel in the South. And that was cool for the last two or three years of that they started driving higher revenue in smaller markets connecting through their mega hubs. But that was all unmanaged and personal traffic. And as the business stuff is recovering, you know, they have a smaller international footprint, uh, they have a smaller coastal footprint. They're getting you know, they're going to have some interesting challenges yeah i i mean i ha, not claiming that like you're it's because of you don't have hubs on the coasts is an interesting take i mean sure I, it's probably true but like we don't have hubs on the coast that was a choice you made guys you had that, that's kind of like yeah yeah it's like we gave this up uh, now and now i'm not sure why investors should feel that that's a good thing yeah um i will also note that uh because of delivery delays from boeing uh, American will be taking fewer 787s this year, and as a result, has announced that a number of routes this winter that were maybe expected to stick around are going to be suspended. So starting in the fall, Charlotte and Dallas to Dublin, Dallas to Rome, JFK to Athens and Barcelona, Chicago to Paris uh, are all being suspended. But how's that? I mean, are they adding other stuff? Like, I don't... I think they did, right? They And we talked about this a little a little bit in a past episode, like when they added Auckland, it was going to be seasonal for some of the flights. Some of the Australia stuff was seasonal, and so it was a matter of finding where they can move planes uh, around and find sort of seasonal shifts. Yeah, yeah. It's hard, especially, you know, how many how many months is a season? You know, six and six is one thing, but if a European route is good for nine, where do you find just, you know, a three-month spit for it or something, and some things like that, and especially as... The other airlines are talking about European shoulder season is stretching out and becoming lucrative. Is it worth, you know, stopping it at six months to move that plane to New Zealand? And how do you make that work? So, um, but that's part of why they wanted more planes and they don't have them. So they got to figure out somewhere to cut. Yes. Yeah. And in the meantime, Delta reported huge numbers and announced a dividend last week. So. Yeah. I mean, that's big news, right? Like, yeah. Return to dividend is always nice for investors. Uh, you know. And I think uh, they actually, Delta doesn't have unionized, only the pilots are union, if I remember correctly. And they announced pay raises for the number of roles and wow. increased bonus pool. So they're, yeah, that's happening. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, Indigo, the Indian Airlines. 350s, baby. Yeah, they've got 30 ordered with 70 options. And delivery starting in 2027. This is going to be real interesting to see how the hell they like, pull this off. Um. Obviously, very different business model when you start pushing long haul. Uh, and I assume they're going long haul, not just increasing capacity in short domestic hops. But uh, you know, how are they going to deal with premium cabin and all that stuff? They have some experience-ish with it today with their wet lease triple sevens from Turkish. But uh, running it themselves is going to be a interesting adjustment, adding wide body. There's a, there's a lot of challenge, I'll say. It's not risk, but challenge is tough. Uh, I wish them luck. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of planes. That's like a yeah. hundred total. That's just that's yeah, I mean, see, see which options come around. But yes, even even 30, with, even thirty, yeah, is a lot of planes. So, but remember, they've got how many hundred single aisles on order? Like they're 
They are by far the biggest in India and looking to keep that going. And they are a partner with Cutter, right? Probably. Subsidiary or something? Yeah, they're not a subsidiary. They're not, I don't think there's any ownership there, but they do code. They, much like with the Turkish stuff, there's a lot of challenges with bilaterals in and out of India with capacity. Yeah. And so Indigo basically is was willing to use its access to uh, slots, routes, frequencies out of as an Indian airline and sort of let the foreign carriers, Turkish and now uh, in Qatar and you know whatnot, sell capacity for it or push more passengers onto it, you know, code share and this and that. And it helped them build up their short haul international services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I use short haul loosely there, but you know. Um, let's talk about Avianca. They're bringing back business class on their A320 Neo. Sort of. So this is fun. They rebranded business class to insignia class. Well, wise. That includes the 787s. Um, and that's just a name change. That product isn't changing. The, that's, that's not that I can see anything if, um, but the domestic fleet, they spent the last couple of years retrofitting to be economy only, but then you can buy up to a premium seat. And the premium seat was blocked middle for the first three rows. Very similar to what uh, frontier just announced for its fleet. Yep. Um, and I'm going to take a sidebar here. Uh, Cause I know you'd mentioned it once before. So did you see the thing where frontier had those seats blocked and someone, and they called the flight over booked and they wouldn't give it to a guy and deplaned him instead. Yeah. I saw that. It's crazy. Yeah. Ah, the seats are not to be occupied. Yes. It's that, but it's a, it's a tough visual for the passengers on board. At least when American was doing that, they put like the, uh, mini table thing in between the seats. I feel like if it was blocked, blocked, yeah, it would feel better. Exactly. Harder to argue it, but there's a seat right there. I'm sorry. We can't use that seat. Those other people paid more for it. Like really. Exactly. Yeah. It's hard. Anyway. So Aviakas does have that seat blocked with the mini table and whatnot. Uh, the middle seat is not available for the first three rows. On 11 routes to America's big cities. So Toronto, New York, D.C., I think, Miami, Mexico City. Uh, I'm going to mess up the South. and I probably already messed up the North. Uh, Sao Paulo, Rio, Santiago. Uh, add in a couple others. Mexico City, did I say that already? Anyway, yeah. there's 11 of them. Uh those will all have this, those seats now sold as business class rather than you buy a coach seat and upgrade to premium space. Interesting. And the, I did some spot check on numbers. It's going to cost more for most passengers to get those seats, assuming you're buying it just as a standalone ticket. Yep. Uh, or one way. It comes with a meal now so and a mini amenity kit, so I guess that's cool, but probably not you know $200 cool. But... The other thing, though, is if you look at some of the routes they fly, Abiyaka does have a small but notable transatlantic market into Europe. Yep. And I feel like this lets them pick up some connecting flow and be able to sell a business ticket, including the onward connection, especially further into South America. Fair. Yeah, that's right. Fair. I don't think I'm going to fly Miami, Miami to Bogota to Paris, yep. but you might be willing to take the stop uh, in Bogota to Rio or Sao Paulo. If you can save some cash on the ticket and still get what looks like premium experience. And today they don't really sell a through ticket as a business class ticket. You have to know how to book that. So, so they only really sell like their non-stops to Bogota that way. Yeah. They, or routes where the 787 flies onward. They had to have some short haul or, you know, America's yeah. Yeah. 787 is too, but they don't, if the 787 isn't flying, they won't sell you the full business ticket. So I think, I feel like that's a big part of why they're doing this. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it also might be like from Miami to Sao Paulo, you can do business class, right? And with a stop in Central America, South America, uh, Copa sells those, but Copa has beds. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you may, you find people booking these as you know, a cheap business class ticket with a connection and not realizing that they don't get a bed, but it'll be interesting. That's another option, but it gives them a way to sell some of this stuff. Yeah. yeah it makes, it makes some sense, um, especially coming from Europe. Like if you're going to one stop somewhere and you could do it, in Bogota over somewhere else. I mean, it can make, make sense. Yeah. I'd probably prefer Bogota to Miami, for example. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Ethiopian is adding Athens to Warsaw, but not allowing local traffic. Yeah. I was bummed about that. Uh, I mean, nice to see them adding a tag flight four days a week. Uh, what's it tag on to? Uh, Otis to Athens. That's a weird, weird. I'm guessing just Athens demand is not quite there and they can, mix and match and get something it seems like i guess it's worth the extra flight time I, what i do wonder is how they're doing the crewing yeah it's strange there's a short hop i wonder and i should check how long 
add us to uh, Warsaw or add us to Athens is they might be able to do a single crew all the way through. Um, it's pretty, t- I mean, I guess timing maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. It's only 2200 miles. So that's like a five hour flight. And then you add on Warsaw adds another two ish, two and a half hours. So you can still that in a full, in a single duty day. I bet they can do the crew all the way through. I wonder how the crew's going to enjoy having their overnight be in Warsaw now instead of Greece. Yeah. How do you think it works for customers going to Warsaw? Do you think they stay on the plane? Yeah. Would be my, uh, that would be my guess. And because it's not carrying local traffic, it will, it would arrive at the international gates in more non Schengen gates in Warsaw. Yeah, that's true. It's because it's, and depart from the non Schengen gates, go into a non Schengen gate at Athens, pick up more people and move on. Yeah. Because yes. it's, because it can't carry local traffic. Local traffic would complicate that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, I think it's cool. It's, it's weird. Yeah. It's cool. Um, we had a listener question. Um, so they were mostly concerned about what's going on at Austin International Airport. Uh, it just, it seems like the TSA pre-check lines, um, it, are bad. Uh, the clear line is bad. Uh, you know, they're, they have like a yes. person that, I mean, it's just bad. It's just so, bad. Uh, this was, and the specific note was a morning flight, especially. Um, and I just pulled up Sirium data here for today, Monday the 29th. Right. So in the five o'clock and six o'clock hours, there's 14 flights departing each. The seven o'clock hour has 21. Total number of seats is three, four, five, six, seventy, five hundred. So 7,500 seats departing in the first three hours of the day. Hmm. Um, that takes some serious staffing to clear. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it holds steady after that. But obviously, some after that, more of them can be connecting. More of them can sort of flow in through some... No one's arriving three hours early for a five o'clock flight, let's say. Yeah. Right. So uh, some more people are arriving three hours early, perhaps at a noon flight, because it's not stupid wake up times. So it does spread out some of the crunch demand a little bit. But I think uh, part of the challenge there is it's just understaffed. And there's some they also uh, our listener notes, they have the multiple different access points, their checkpoints. And I remember this from 20 ish years ago when I was commuting there for work. I guess it's still a mess of which is open when and what you can actually use. Yep. So I know you, what was the last time you were down there? You got family. Right? Yeah. My wife, my wife was down there last year. Um, okay. she said, it's, it's still, it's still a mess. And my family was up here, I don't know, a couple months ago and they said still a mess, but they're the kind that arrives at the airport three hours before their flight. So, okay. so at least they had time to deal with the mess. Yeah. Yeah. But they did say it's impossible to know by quickly if the other checkpoint is open. Yeah. So you can waste your time walking down there, and then it's closed. So, so maybe we'll get some better signage installed? Yeah, you would think. I, I don't... I mean, it's really crowded, in even in the central hallway. Right? Yeah. Like, in the main area. And so I think that adds to some of the problems. So... And not room to move, to walk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People are trying yeah, to... Like, I, I vaguely remember that. It's the, like, from the door to the counters and whatnot is a relatively shallow space. Exactly. Yeah. So... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, and he, the, the listener mentions that, uh, you know, AA is pulling all their nonstop. So now you have to take, you know, the super early flight connecting. So, yeah. Compounds um, the problem. And American, right? American five o'clock hour has two, four, and six, five, and seven. And then it stays sort of three three to five flights an hour. So they're using probably two gates, but um, yeah. using their space reasonably well. But you know, especially if you don't want to fly to Charlotte, um, you do have that. Uh, Five o'clock to Dallas and a five thirty to Miami. There you go. Yeah, the best flights on earth. No. Yeah. Uh, Ad life choices. Yeah. If you're on a scheduled flight schedule. Uh, DWC. Let's talk about Dubai World. Is it what is it? Central? Central. Yeah. Uh, sort of what that the uh, it's Al Maktoum International Airport officially, uh, also known as DWC for the airport code or Dubai World Central. This is the airport south of Dubai Town that for the last twenty years has been on the cusp of taking over and being a glorious masterpiece of architecture and uh, passenger experience. It's only been for 20 something years though. So, you know, it's okay that it hasn't actually happened. So these new renderings that they've got. Yep. So this, so on Sunday, the Sheik, who's the head of the Dubai government formally approved the design plans. Like again, this has happened before and slightly different this time though. Uh, has it formally approved the design plans for the multi-billion dollar, let's actually build this thing, let's get going. It's unclear when construction is actually going to start. The timeline is still a decade for phase one to complete, which should be the 
initial passenger terminal space and probably a second runway. And uh, the plan calls for eventually five parallel runways, a head gate area building plus four, we'll say remote pod type things that are, you know, multiple gates each. Ultimately, they expect 400 hard stands, or excuse me, 400 contact gates, 400 airplane gates, mm. which is just an insane number. Yeah, I mean, it's huge. Uh, but it's, it is the second largest physical plot of land dedicated to airport service currently in the world. 140 the square kilometers dedicated. What's the first? Uh, I knew you were going to ask me that. Let me pull it Denver? Up. No, it's slightly bigger. This is slightly bigger than Denver. Um, see, I can. I found it yesterday when I was writing up my report. And then didn't I want to take, take some guesses. It's not Denver. Denver close. I think Denver was third. Uh, uh see, just massive airport. I mean, yeah. Singapore. Uh, Riyadh is marked as 780 square kilometers. Denver's 137, DFW is 78. This is 141. Wow. Uh, so, wow. That was in 2019. Things may have changed since. And yeah, but that was the numbers that I had online. But yeah, it was on Twitter. So take that with a grain of salt. Yeah. But I think they're right. I mean, do you, what are your predictions on this? It's happened once. We've seen mock ups and things. Um, and they've talked about it, right? That it requires the, Dubai government saying Dubai International is closing to commercial traffic. And if it stays open at all, right, even like LaGuardia style or DCA style where it's got limited to shorter routes or something like that, any of that probably breaks this plan. You got to go full mayor daily and just bulldoze that runway, um, which is probably a terrible plan also. Talk, well, talk about Meg's, Meg's Field. Meg's Field, yeah. Um, I, I don't see it working unless they force all traffic to DWC. They could do that. I don't think it's a terrible idea to do that. Um, it is further away. They're talking about, you know, high speed rail to get people into town because the traffic on those highways is terrible just for the air show. I can't imagine for actual passenger volumes. Um, back in 2018, it was going to be a hyperloop. So obviously that's not going to be real now. Since that's I don't know what you're talking about. I think that's, I mean, that's definitely going to happen. Yeah. You know, they actually finally shut down the fraud there, but, uh, yeah. So that's, uh, that's going to be a challenge. And, but, and so, right. Maybe you flip things around right now. DWC has a massive, gorgeous FBO for private operations. Maybe Dubai International becomes the private terminal. Like you keep one of the Emirates terminals in place and, or somehow convert it and like use, take advantage of this huge, gorgeous lounge spaces. But as long as DXB, Dubai International, the main, air, the current main airport stays in business, I don't see how you convince passengers and airlines to move down to DWC. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the key. And I, they've, come, I, they've talked about it before. They tried to say Fly Dubai is going to move there in 2017. They announced that in 2016. It did not. It said Fly Dubai actually increased flights, at, decreased the flights at DWC, moved more to Dubai International, and set up a stronger code share alliance joint venture-ish with... Uh, frequent flyer air reciprocity all that crap with emirates i mean i think they're going to have to do a couple things i think they're going to have to build up the infrastructure first yeah which i think they can do um and then make it i i think they could leave short haul flights out of the central airport how do you do that given how much of emirates operation is connecting flow that's fair i mean but what if like what if what if uh fly dubai stays it they have a map. They're doing a lot of connections between the two. There's a huge code share operation there. Well, that's a problem that they created for themselves. Then it is. Uh, and fly to Boston going to have seven eight sevens too. So even that makes it challenging. Like the uh, the other part of this is like uh, Qatar Airways used to run a shuttle to DWC just because they could. Yeah. Um. To like, and I don't know if they were induced by the Qatar or by the uh, UAE government to like put flights there or something. But man, those planes were A three twenties that were frequently empty. Just because no one was going. Yeah, no, like, the number of people doing just the point-to-point flights was relatively low. There was minimal demand for stuff outside of town as opposed to in city center. And so why would you go to the south side of town if you could just be in the city center on the transit line, uh, you know, 15-minute drive instead of 45 from where you want to be? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And again, some of that can get fixed with transit. Some of that can get fixed with some things. And the UAE has shown, I feel like, when it wants to build infrastructure, it will. And so the excuse of, oh, you know, it's the UAE, they don't, they don't have the experience of building airports like they do in the West. Like, right. They actually can build them fast if they want. Yeah. And, and, all, the, and all the, and all the infrastructure. It's very strange excuses being made there, but, uh, I don't know. 
I, I, I would like to see it. I'm just, I'm being far more skeptical than most. And it's just based on the fact that I've been around long enough to have seen them fall several times. Is DXB at capacity at this point? Very much so. Um, very much so. I will say one thing in favor of this actually happening is Emirates has made public statements saying, I'm pretty sure this is happening. Yeah. Right. They're basically saying, hey, look at these renderings of what's going to be our new home now, timing wise and whatever. But uh, it's going to happen. I mean, for them, if it, if it opens up more gates and, and you know, a better experience, I, I see them being on board at this point. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, let's talk about open table. Yeah, this one came in through Ed. Um, real quick note here. Just if you've left reviews on open table before for restaurants. Uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks, they're all going to suddenly have your name and picture associated with them. So if you're not happy about that, you should go delete them. Why is this a thing? Because they open table thinks people will trust the reviews more if they have a name and face associated with them. Um, and you know, user privacy be damned. Wow. That's pretty awful. Yeah. I just checked, I checked my account. I'm very glad I hadn't provided any reviews. Yeah. I don't think I've, I don't think I've done and it. Listen, some people might not mind having their name associated with these, with reviews, but. It's just, it, it's the part where they're doing it retroactively. Like, you want to do that for all new reviews? Cool. Knock yourself out. Tell people, do it for new ones. Going back and retroactively applying it just seems stupid to me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, JetBlue had an anti-union play. I don't know the details of this, so I'm going to let you describe it. I read this story again. So, uh, I think their ground handlers are trying to unionize. Okay. Uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, and... Yeah, and they've been posting, like, signs in the lunch break room saying, you know, reminding everybody that they've never had any furloughs and that, quote, a union can, can promise whatever it wants, but it can't guarantee anything. In negotiations, all the union can do is ask. The company can't be forced to do to agree to anything that doesn't make good business sense. Blah, blah. So, nah. Uh, not, a, not a good look. No, especially because it's possibly illegal under the NLRB guidance. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. You know, we might just lose the NLRB here in a couple weeks, months, years anyways, based on lawsuits. So we'll see. Wow. Um, and then lastly, Austrian. And this is this affects you. So Austrian is going to be taking their 787 deliveries and uh, starting some proving runs with them. And uh, they're going to do it on some routes that you might be on. Yeah, we're going to try to make that work. Uh, the sort of short haul stuff to start. So the plane's going to fly uh, from Vienna to Frankfurt and Berlin starting okay. May 17th. And then it'll move from there to add Dusseldorf on June seventeenth, and then long haul stuff comes later. So, wow! Turns out I'm gonna have I have a spare some spare time in Europe on May twenty fourth, I think. Um, and ironically, I'm gonna spend some time in Vienna on the thirty first, and could have flown to get there, but I'm taking the train to get there on the thirty first. So, on the twenty fourth, I might do a quick round trip out and back to see what it's all about. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, business class seats are cheap. Going leaving Berlin is getting back is proving financially challenging so i gotta figure out if that works yeah 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 um i think that's i think that's it anything else you want to chat about before we go to the bonus topics no i think that's got us covered cool we're going to talk about some uh phantom inventory uh and on united and then uh, a bunch of charter stuff some terms and conditions uh attorney generals getting the power to investigate airlines i think that's that's kind of important uh and then avello adding some some new routes and uh beyond fifth freedom rights so we're gonna talk about that all cut up for the Patreon subscribers. So stick around. If you're not a Patreon subscriber, thanks for listening to the show. Thanks for supporting us. Uh, we'll talk to you next time. Happy travels. Take care.